Hello and welcome to this webinar series on satellite observations for analyzing natural hazards on small island nations. This is a three-part webinar series and today's focus will be on assessing pre-storm conditions and post-storm impacts. I'll be presenting during part of this session as well as my colleagues Amita Mehta and Sean McCartney from NASA Goddard and guest speaker John Englander who's the executive director of the Caribbean Center for Rising Seas. My name is Erica Podest and I'm a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and an instructor with the RCEP program. I'll start out with an introduction on the training objectives and training outline for this webinar series. The training objectives for this webinar series are to identify applications of passive and active remote sensing data for flooding, storm impacts, landslides, and sea level rise. So we'll be using optical data as well as synthetic aperture radar and radar altimetry. Another objective is to perform an analysis pre and post storm for a region of interest. Assess the landslide hazard for a region of interest prior to and during an event. And finally, interpret satellite derived products for characterizing sea level rise on a regional scale. This is a breakdown of the different sessions that are part of this webinar series. Today's session is on pre and post storm impacts focusing on the Caribbean and a particular case study for Hurricane Maria and its impacts on Puerto Rico. The second session on Tuesday, August 24th will be on assessing sea level rise at the regional to local scale. Leading that session will be guest speaker Dr. Benjamin Hamlington from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The final session in this three-part series will be on Thursday, August 26, on assessing landslide hazards, which will be led by guest speaker Thomas Stanley from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Here we have an outline of what will be covered during today's session starting with a short overview of the RCEP program, followed by an overview of sea level rise and flooding by guest speaker John Englander. Amita Mehta will then cover natural disasters in small island nations, and will do a short demo on monitoring storms using remote sensing and earth system model data. I'll then briefly discuss aspects of SAR data and show, then show a, a demo on using SAR data on Google Earth Engine to assess flooding in Puerto Rico from Hurricane Maria. The demo will also include a contribution from my colleague Sean McCartney, which I will present, showing differences in NDVI before and after the storm, as well as assessing exposed population and inundated agricultural areas. Now I'll talk briefly about the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Program, or RSET. At RSET, our mission is to provide accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, models, and tools to increase the use of Earth observations in decision-making activities. RSET offers both in-person and online trainings at a variety of levels, and this allows participants to learn remote sensing based on their level of experience and need. RSET offers trainings in the following application areas, disasters, health and air quality, land management, and water resources. Next, our guest speaker, John Englander, will talk about rising waters for time horizons. John Englander is the executive director of the Caribbean Center for Rising Seas. He's also an oceanographer, climate consultant, and author. His most recent book is titled Moving to Higher Ground, Rising Sea Level and the Path Forward. John, thank you very much for being here and for sharing your knowledge and expertise in this RSET training. Thank you, Erica. It's a pleasure to be with this audience, both those that create the data, those that analyze it, and those that use the data. I want to talk about rising waters, which is, of course, one of the big risks that we're all concerned about these days. I want to talk to you about it from a slightly different perspective of four different time horizons. When we 
accumulate data, and particularly the kind of precise data that NASA and uh, many of the cooperating organizations involved here use, we're really doing it to get knowledge. And of course, the ultimate uh, purpose of that is to add to public safety. In the sense of flooding, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that we're both dealing with short-term flood events and risks, but also long-term designs because the world's changing rather quickly. Coastal flooding is often described as a problem, but I would suggest respectfully that we really need to think of it as six or seven different problems. There's storms, which is the obvious uh, thing like a hurricane or typhoons in the Pacific. And storms bring waves and storm surge, which gets up inside of canals and waterways and amplifies. But that's all weather driven. Then apart from storms, there's just heavy rainfall. And as the oceans warm, we're getting heavier rainfall, dramatically so in many places, which seems counterintuitive because we're also getting more drought, but those things go together in a warming world. Rainfall, which might be, let's say, um, 10 inches, 20 some centimeters in a, in a period of time, rainfall can also go, run downhill to a lower spot. It could be a lower street, it could be down a ravine, a valley, down a, a stream going into a river, runoff multiplies rainfall. And so when we think about flood water heights, we need to think about storms as being one format or vector, increasing rainfall is another, and then topography and uh, valleys and, and waterways will turn that into runoff at a multiplied value to rain. Then there's tides. We're all familiar with tides moving up and down almost twice a day due to the pull of the moon largely. We know that if new moons or full moons that tides are even higher. And more and more often there's awareness that the lunar tide cycle, an 18.6 year cycle, which adds or subtracts to tides to the level of about six centimeters, about two and a half inches, on a regular pattern going up and down over 19 years, or more specifically 18.6 years. And that's manifest these days as what are often called uh, sunny day flood events or king tides. The tides aren't really changing, but the tides are appearing to be higher at peaks because sea level's rising. And we tend to confuse these things because we, many people often use similar words to describe different aspects of flooding. But rising sea level is different because it's like a drip filling the bucket. It's happening very slowly. And we really only notice it during those peak high tides, which are getting higher over the kind of um, mysterious cycles of tides, which follow the, again, the moons and the 18.6 year tide cycle. So all of those five flood factors have different magnitudes, different uh, recovery times, and we'll talk about them in a second. And then there's coastal erosion. And often flooding is confused in terms of terminology with erosion. I said that there are six or seven kinds of flooding and it's useful to have more specific words like these six phrases here, storms, rain, runoff, tides, sea level rise and erosion. And another one that some of you may, may be aware of is tsunamis. And in fact, more and more places are posting tsunami warning signs for evacuation or uh, enhancing the tsunami warning system. Tsunamis would be an entirely different kind of flooding along with earthquakes because they're typically driven by earthquakes and um, are really outside the format of these normal five flood factors plus coastal erosion. So just that's from terminology, both uh, to understand things better, but also to communicate them better to your various audiences. Storms are well known and well understood. There's one centered on Puerto Rico. I think that must have been uh, um, Hurricane Maria, if I'm not mistaken. We also remember Hurricane Sandy as it breached the New Jersey shoreline. This was a no-name storm in Fort Lauderdale a month after Hurricane Sandy. 
we're familiar with storms, but we're also seeing these king tides. This is San Francisco. Some of you may have been there. It's the Embarcadero. This is deep inside San Francisco Bay. It's uh, largely blocked from the ocean, which comes past under the Golden Gate Bridge. This is just normal bay chop or small waves that are breaking over the seawall. That's not an ocean wave. That's just wind-driven bay chop. And it's happening more and more where it's flooding the streets. And that street's been there for over 100 years at that elevation on the Embarcadero. And it has not had subsidence or uplift. In other words, the level of that street has stayed fundamentally unchanged in relation to global sea level. But they're having a new problem, which is that at king tides or extreme high tides, the water is breaking over the seawall and causing difficulty, salt water, of course. And it's not that the tides are getting higher, it's that sea level globally is rising and that manifests as higher high tides. So this is just to support my case that we've got to be a little more specific than to talk about flooding, because flooding comes from different things. This is from Fort Lauderdale, the oldest house in Broward County, Stranahan House. When that was built 100 years ago, it, the docks didn't go underwater. That's a blue, a sunny uh, skies or blue sky flooding event, just based upon the tide cycle, which is getting higher because sea level is getting higher. Here's a, another typical street scene in Fort Lauderdale. You can see a truck on the right and boats off in the distance on the canal, just a few hundred feet away. But in this community, they actually have no wake signs on the streets to put up when the salt water is on the streets to caution cars not to drive too fast and spray salt water. And then as soon as the peak high tide has dissipated in a couple of days, they take that sign down because uh, when some of them want to go sell their house, they don't really want the prospective buyers to see a no wake sign to prod the question of why do you have a no wake sign on a street? When I talk about four time horizons to think of flooding, I'd like to suggest these. Geologic time, what scientists call the paleo record, is perhaps 10,000 years or longer, thousands of years. The observational record, which many of you are involved with, is either providers or users, which we'll talk about in a moment, starts in 1850, as I'll show you, going back to tide gauges, and then in 1993 in the more sophisticated satellite record and remote sensing. Then the next time period we need to think about is today and tomorrow, in quotes. And of course, that's the great concern of prediction of what will flooding be in the next few hours when a storm is approaching, or as sea level and other flooding brings the water higher. What do we need to plan for? And that can be a forecast period of three hours, 30 days, or 30 years, um, which gets us to the fourth category. For planning and projection purpose, it's important to think about 30 to 100 years because that's the design life of buildings and infrastructure. So I think you can see that all four of these time horizons, geologic time is largely irrelevant except to give us some understanding about what could happen for the future. Then there's the observational record going back 170 years roughly where we can really look at realistic accurate measurements which have gotten better. We use that information to project what's going to happen during the next storm event or during the lifespan of a building and what do we need to design for and engineer for, which gets us into the planning and projection horizon. If we look at Florida, it actually proves geologically just how dramatic this change is. We all know the shape of Florida today. 20,000 years ago, Florida was 400 feet or 120 some meters lower, sea level was lower, meaning that Florida was twice the size because the, particularly the Western bank was exposed. But 120,000 years ago in geologic history in the paleo record, sea level was 25 feet, about seven meters higher. And the exposed land area of Florida was about half the present. So Florida is just 
is a good demonstration, although this happened all over the world. To share the concept of sea level change over geologic time, this is since the last ice age about 22,000 years ago, when the ice sheets were at a maximum and sea level was at a minimum. It was 390 feet, 120 meters below today. And sea level rose as the ice sheets melted, not in some straight line, not even in some smooth curve line. There were some inflection points or changes of slope shown by those three blue arrows. And then sea level got to the present level about 6,000 years ago, which happens to be the record of human civilization, more or less, which is why we tend to have trouble believing it will change greatly, because it's been fairly um, stable for a few thousand years. And we'll look at that more clearly in a moment. The other thing I would point out is that when sea level rose quickly, during where these blue arrows are, when it changed slope, you could not predict what was about to happen based upon the recent past. Now, many of us believe that we're in that such an era again, that the recent past no longer predicts the near future. And lastly, to note on this slide that when sea level rose quickly 11,000 years ago, most recently, it rose at the rate of about five meters a century, about 16 feet in one century. That happened naturally. So it's an important um, reference point to realize that we really can get to, to a foot of sea level rise a decade, 30 centimeters. And just showing a building here onto the right for reference. So sea level rose about 30 floors of a building, that 390 feet, 120 meters since the last ice age. And if we melt all the remaining ice on the planet, sea level would go up another 17 floors, 212 feet. This information is pulled together in a graph, and I'm glad to uh, uh, share this with you. It's uh, something I put together with the help of Dr. James Hansen and his uh, colleague, Dr. Makiko Saito, as noted there on the right. It's in my book, Moving to Higher Ground, and actually in the book, it gives you instructions on how to, where you can download this but I'd be glad to make it available to you as well. It looks at 400,000 years of ice ages through global temperature shown in red and sea level shown in blue. And of course, on a warmer planet, there's less ice, so sea level is higher. And the converse is true. On a cooler planet, there's more ice on land and sea level is lower. And we can see that if you just follow the red line, that sea level or global temperature has moved up and down in a fairly regular pattern. We're at a peak of the normal pattern. The difference or the um, period between the typical global warming or ice age patterns is 100,000 years. That's a natural cycle. We also notice that the red line and the green line, carbon dioxide, move in sync as just as the red and blue lines move in sync. And the problem is that um, whereas historically it was uh, the Milankovitch cycle, which is a variation of energy we receive from the sun based upon the uh, elliptical orbit, the wobble, and the tilt of the Earth, which combined into something called the Milankovitch cycle, first documented in 1938 by Milutin Milankovitch. And that explains the cause of the ice ages, the up and down variation of this red line. It's, it's like a giant summer and winter. Well, so that heating and cooling of five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit from an ice age to now was happening at a fairly regular period of about 100,000 years. And as you can see, the warming takes about 20,000 years and the cooling about 80,000 years. And it's reasonable to assume that being at a fairly high spot in the normal cycle here, off to the right on the red line, that we probably were turning the corner and would have been entering the cooling phase of 80,000 years to the next ice age. But the green line, carbon dioxide, shows us the problem because its normal range was 180 to 280 parts per million, and it's now at about 415 parts per million and moving straight up. Now, what's just without getting technical here, when the planet warms, the oceans release carbon dioxide. So historically, 
it was the Milankovitch cycle, this orbital variation that changes the amount of heat energy we get, effectively a giant summer and winter every 100,000 years. When the oceans warm, they release carbon dioxide, and when the oceans cool, they absorb carbon dioxide. So the temperature or red line basically drove the green line, our carbon dioxide level, going back thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years actually. But now a different phenomenon has taken over because it was proven in 1859 that carbon dioxide trapped heat. And as we've changed the CO2 level of the atmosphere quite unnaturally by human impact, um, that extra heat trapped in the atmosphere is warming the ocean. So the red and green lines go together over thousands of years, centuries even, but there's a lag time and either one can move, the other will follow, given centuries or millennia for adjustment. I hope that was clear. Now let's get to the data, which you collect through um, the work that you all do, or as, either as providers or consumers or interpreters. If we look since 1850, which is the beginning of the tide gauge database, basically, within reasonably good accuracy, we can get a picture of global sea level rise from the hundreds of tide gauges around the world that were basically pulled into a network. But then in recent times, we've got satellite data, which you're far more expert in than I, many of you, uh, shown here in the upper right with a red line. And if we take that in a little more detail, we just hone in on the satellite record, we can see that since it began in 1993 with Topex, that the his record was about one and a half millimeters a year. If we look at the, since the year 2000, the rate is about 3.2 millimeters a year. It's dramatically increasing, more than doubling. And if we look at the last decade, we're approaching five millimeters a year in the last couple of years, and maybe too short a window of time to get, um, uh, a definitive number, but the point is this is accelerating. And as we've learned from the pandemic, it's not so much the number, it's the potential for abrupt change in rate and um, either geometric growth or even exponential growth that will surprise us. And that's the case with sea level rise. Now, the problem with sea level ultimately is the amount of ice on land. And as we can see from this global depiction, uh, the, you probably know this, but the ice on land is really in Greenland and Antarctica. 98% of potential sea level rise is in those two places. The rest is in glaciers from Alaska to the Alps, um, but really for practical purposes, it's all in Antarctica and Greenland, and it's about one eighth in Greenland and uh, seven eighths in Antarctica. Greenland's where it's melting fastest. The Arctic does have a, a, the Arctic amplification where more of the heat is going into the northern hemisphere and showing up around the northern region. Just to give you a sense of the size of Greenland, because it's hard to recognize its, its uh, scale, I take fact-finding groups there typically once a year, and it's just it's it's hard to describe. But here, in simple uh, comparative depictions, you can see it compared to the United States, the eastern United States. And that's pretty accurate. We think of the melting Arctic, and whether it be the plight of the polar bear and their habitat, or just the fact of more icebergs and, and sea ice, as the world warms and this polar ice cap disappears, it goes from bright white to dark blue ocean. As that happens, it's one of those feedback loops because the darker water absorbs more heat does not reflect like the white ice. But I would also point out a point of confusion. Floating ice, whether it be sea ice like this or an iceberg, does not affect sea level. Like ice cubes in a glass, as depicted there in the upper right, and you can run this experiment at home, ice cubes like icebergs are about 10% above the surface. If you mark the level of liquid in the glass, with floating ice cubes and let the ice melt, the level of liquid won't change. That's because just before ice or water freezes, 
it expands slightly and becomes less dense. So as it melts, it actually compacts a little bit and takes up less space. And that's why icebergs or ice cubes stick out of the water about 10%. But as they melt, they have no, level, no effect on the level of liquid. It's the glaciers on land that we need to be concerned about. This example's from um, either Greenland or Svalbard, but it could be Antarctica. As these glaciers move toward the sea and break off and calve into new icebergs, that's like adding a new ice cube to the glass. That will cause the level of liquid to rise. Also, melt water from the ice on land melting as the world gets warmer will add to the level of liquid, as you could easily imagine. The third phenomenon that adds to global sea level is land moving up or down, subsidence or uplift. There are many places where land is subsiding, and there are some places where land is uplifting. And that will have an effect to, um, uh, to distort the picture of sea level from those vantage points. So in other words, if sea level was rising uh, 10 inches in the last century, but if some place had the land sinking 30 inches, like New Orleans, for example, roughly, it would appear that sea level, when viewed from New Orleans, had risen 40 inches. The 10 inches of global sea level rise plus the 30 inches that the land had, had sunk. I hope that makes sense. So what about the future? I mean, data to understanding, to lessons for our world in a practical standpoint is I think what we're most all concerned about. If we look out 30 years and 100 years within the design life of buildings and infrastructure and even communities, we have to think different because most data that we're concerned about, from weather forecasts to even longer-term predictions going out, days or up to three weeks, four weeks, for long-term weather forecasts, are really important for imminent flooding. But they're not going to tell us anything about sea level rise, because sea level is rising at that rate of about four or five millimeters a year, less than a quarter of an inch. When we think about flooding like what happened in Puerto Rico, or actually we could look at any storm event all over the world, of course, we're not worried about a quarter of an inch. We're worried about inches, feet, or meters, I should say. And in this new era of a warming world, and most of you will be aware that back on August 9th, um, not too long ago, that the new IPCC report came out and kind of locked in the, the evidence and the forecast that the world is warming and it's accelerating and we have very little time to slow it. And to some degree, regardless of we, what we do, many of the effects are already locked in. So we have to look at the effects of flooding and our ability to project in the near term for weather events. But we also need to start planning infrastructure and buildings that will last at least 30 years. That's a mortgage cycle in most places. And sea level is often mistakenly attributed to the problems today. Now, again, sea level is only rising about a quarter of an inch a year. That rate may have tripled in the last 30 years. But the problem today isn't sea level rise. It manifests with the peak high tides. But we do need to plan for sea level rise, which now could be a meter or two higher this century, depending on how warm the planet is. So that gets us back to why I suggest that we have to break flooding into different kinds of flooding and make sure that when we're combining water levels in the near term to predict a flood that might happen tomorrow or next week with a storm approaching, we're characterizing it properly because we're barely seeing the effects of sea level so far. But we know from the paleo record, that geologic data, that sea level does change hundreds of feet vertically, which surprises most people to learn. But it's in the geologic textbooks for 100 years, the ice ages. And it goes along with the simplicity of the ice ages. The planet has had natural heating and cooling cycles. But now we're warming it, as the IPCC shows. And as we look to make com communities safer and plan for the future, 
we have to think about these different flood factors. In the geologic scale to get clarity, the observational record to see what's happening, looking at the confluence of near-term data to say what could happen in the next three hours or three days with storms and the need to evacuate. But none of those things will really show us what how much sea level is going to rise in the next 30 years or by the year 2100. But I like 30 years. It gets us to mid-century and it is a mortgage cycle. So gathering data is extremely important. Applying it to flood projections is what's vital to people. And we just need to be clear which kind of flooding we're talking about. The storms, the rain, the runoff, the extreme tides and the slowly accumulating sea level rise. From data to knowledge to safety. We don't have any choice about rising with the tide. The ocean doesn't care what our day-to-day -day problems are of budgets, architecture, emergency evacuations. But for our generation and future generations, we do need to improve the data, the understanding, and the takeaway lessons so that we design communities that are viable and can thrive in the future. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the very interesting information. I'm Amita Mehta, and I will start with a brief background about the types of disasters that commonly occur in island nations. Then we will focus on how to use remote sensing data for monitoring pre-storm conditions and post-storm impact assessment. So there are hundreds of islands and close to 50 island nations throughout the world's oceans. The United Nations lists 58 member and non-member small island developing states. As shown in this figure, total population of these island nations is more than 757 million. The area of these island nations also varies substantially. For example, Indonesia has the largest area of more than 1,900,000 square kilometer and the Marshall Islands have area as small as 181 square kilometers. These maps show island nations in the Atlantic Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and Caribbean Sea. And these maps show the same for Indian Ocean and Western and Eastern and Southern Pacific Ocean. And as you can notice, uh, both Caribbean Sea and Pacific Ocean have a large number of island nations. Disasters in small island nations are shown here. So major disasters include cyclones, hurricanes or typhoons, torrential rain, floods and landslides, storm surge, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic activity. The figure here shows the damages caused by Hurricane Matthew in Haiti in Caribbean. Also, Islands are the most vulnerable to climate change related disasters. As shown in this figure, coastal regions and islands appear to have large number of climate hotspots for disasters. One of the biggest impacts of climate change in island nations is rising sea level. As this figure shows, in the Marshall Islands, the rising sea levels already flood the coastal regions. Specifically, in Caribbean Sea, based on the relief web data set, between 2000 and 2019, total of 1,205 disasters occurred. That included 548 floods, 330 storms, and as shown in this list, a number of earthquakes, droughts, landslides, wildfires, extreme temperature events, and volcanic events occurred. So floods and storms appear to be the most common disasters in Caribbean. Since 2000, 12 floods have caused damages which are worth 1 billion US dollar. And 
on an average occurrence of 17 hurricanes per year with 23 category 5 hurricanes during this period. Precipitation, winds and storm surge associated with hurricanes, typhoons or cyclones are the most damaging parameters that affect conditions and lives on islands. Heavy rains can cause flooding and can trigger landslides in certain regions. Strong winds can cause infrastructure damages. Storm surge can result in coastal flooding, uh, in settlements and bring salt water on shore. So in the rest of this presentation, we will focus on remote sensing and earth system model data useful for monitoring storms and assessing post-storm impacts on flooding on island nations. We will use a case study of Hurricane Maria and how it affected Puerto Rico in 2017. As shown in this animation, remote sensing data provide continuous large spatial coverage of approaching storms uh, to an island or to a settlement. We will use the data sources listed in this table to track intensity of Hurricane Maria. We will see how to access and analyze rainfall from iMERGE or integrated multi-satellite retrievals for GPM and sea level pressure and wind speed from modern era retrospective analysis for research and application version 2. This is an atmospheric model. We will also briefly see how to access near real time and forecast data that is rainfall, sea level pressure and winds from GEOS 5 which is called Earth Observing System version 5. These data sets are described in detail in this RSET webinar uh, and the link is available here. Also in the appendix, uh, several features of these data sets are described. I will first demonstrate how to, you, how to access um, and analyze and visualize rainfall data from iMERGE and MERA2, that is sea level pressure and winds, uh, using a web tool called Giovanni. Also note that iMERGE is available from Google Earth Engine also, and we will see that very briefly at the end. And we will look at whether analysis and prediction site that shows near real time and forecast data from GEOS 5. Just to summarize, the iMERGE data are available half hour, every half hour at point one to point one degree special resolution since June of 2000. The MERA2 data are available every hour at half a degree by 0.667 degree special resolutions and they are available since 1980. GEOS5 uh, near real time and forecast data are available hourly at 0.3125 degree by 0.25 degree resolution. Next, we will see the demonstration of data access analysis and visualization for Hurricane Maria as, approaches, as it approaches Puerto Rico. When it uh, appeared um, or approached Puerto Rico, it was Hurricane Category 4 and it uh, affected the island between, most severely between 20th and 22nd September uh, 2017. It caused high number of casualties, destruction of properties including roads and traffic lights, and there were, there were large scale power outages. Also, migration of thousands of residents from Puerto Rico to US mainland was also noted in months following uh, Hurricane Maria. So with that, we will start with the demonstration. This demonstration uses Giovanni Web Tool to search, analyze, visualize, and download data. What we're going to do first is animate, learn to animate rainfall, sea level pressure, and wind speed to monitor Hurricane Maria before it made landfall on Puerto Rico. Then we will also see some other features such as how to get accumulated rainfall or rainfall time series at a specific location. Here we start with iMERGE search data. We already know that we want to use 
rainfall from iMERGE. So we can type iMERGE here. And as you can see, multiple options are there. For past data, we use iMERGE Final, which is a research quality product. But for near real time current hurricanes, you can use iMERGE Early or iMERGE Late, which has a few hours of latency. Let's pick iMERGE Final and search. You will see a number of options with different temporal resolutions and the one that we want is the highest special resolution and temporal resolution uh, it's half hourly one tenth of a degree in millimeter per hour rainfall rate and we're going to pick this multi-satellite precipitation estimate with great gauge calibration once you pick the data you can pick the analysis option from select plot option here there are maps there are other um, analysis options, and then there are time series. We're going to focus on maps and time series here. First, let's animate rainfall to see how um, the storm propagated and made landfall over uh, Puerto Rico. Here is the temporal selection. We know that the hurricane was in 2017, September. And the maximum intensity was between 20th and 22nd over Puerto Rico. Let's take 19th to um, say 23rd of September. And we can animate this data for the region of our interest here. We can select the region which I already have. If you uh, zoom out, you have this global map and you can pan in and zoom in to select the region of your interest and draw a box. So let's zoom a little more and get the Puerto Rico, which is this island here, and draw a box. You can draw a box or you can enter let exact latitude longitude here if you like. Once you have picked the region, you can plot data and that launches a workflow. So to save the time, I've already created this animation so you can view that. And here is the animation. Uh, you can see that this starts on 19th of September. You can click on this and see, you can speed up if you like. Um, you can see how outer bands are starting to move on Puerto Rico and then the actual um, heavy bands and I they arrive on 20th of September just about. It started around 8 uh, in, or this is like 9.30 p.m. It allows you to pick exact half hourly image to further analyze and see how it affected um, in, in together with other uh, parameters that we will see. Um, so this is how you can animate any data that you pick from Giovanni. And I have done the same. You can go back to uh, the results. You can pick the same domain but now you can change the data set. You can pick MERA2 and you can say sea level pressure and search. And you can see again there is monthly and hourly data. We want MERA2 uh, which is the this one um, hourly and you can select that and go through the animation. Similarly, you can say win, say, and search. And you can see that there is surface wind speed. This is monthly, then there is hourly. This is instantaneous. And there is also time average over this hour. Let's look at instantaneous winds, which is what we usually look at uh, to detect or assess how much damage those winds uh, can make. And then again, you can plot data and animate. I have animated both of them. And so let's see.
So this is, I picked a bigger domain here and as you can see, this is sea level pressure. 996 was the uh, hectopascal was the lowest uh, pressure and as you can see the low cent this center moves here you can again see the time for that um, and um, note down for when exactly the storm approached And here is the low pressure center uh, that uh, it's just about 7.30 around um, to on, on 20th of uh, September. Similarly, you can see winds. So these are wind speeds in meters per second. And so uh, highest was here is 30 meters per second. Uh, as you can, you can again watch this and see how the storm approached and how winds changed and then very heavy winds they appear right on this eastern and southern part again um, this is so 20th was the time when it started affecting 20th of September um, early in the morning and too late in the evening it affected uh, the island so this allows you to pick um, just browse and understand what how storm propagated what was the speed how was the uh, impact that you can assess based on this at that time it's relatively a low resolution data uh, but still it provides you information large-scale information about how uh, storm propagated and arrived on, on on the island one last thing you can download all these data so you can have image files you can download PNG images for each of that frame, a uh, half hourly frame. And more importantly, you can click on here uh, to download NetCDF files. It, when you click here, you get a list of URLs for all the files that went into making that animation. And then you can use WGET or CURL or any um, software to actually fetch that data based on the URL. It's, it's open. So finally, a couple of more analysis options um, we're demonstrating here. Um, we know that on 20th of September, there was landfall and heavy rain arrived on Puerto Rico. So here is an analysis. You can make a time averaged map uh, of, and I've picked 20th of September, 11.30 AM. Um, and one thing to note here is that you can also pick a country or a US uh, state by clicking here you can pick the shape file and let's pick Puerto Rico and it, it if you zoom in you can see that now the data will be just for Puerto Rico and so we want to find out exactly when the uh, heavy rain bands arrived how much was the rain and how it was distributed over the country so once you pick that you can plot data and I already have that so that uh, you can look at it. This is the rainfall distribution. Um, and uh, you can see that it's heaviest in the southern part. Uh, each uh, grid box is displayed on the upper left hand. And here is the heaviest rainfall around minus 60, 65.9 west, 18 north. Um, you can look at uh, sea level pressure from Mera 2 just like we did for iMERGE and it's lowest over here large gradient here so this coincides with the heavy rainfall and if you look at winds it's higher where the uh, pressure gradient is high and you would expect anti-clockwise winds bringing moisture over this region and pouring a lot of rain in here so as it, it's a consistent picture you can download these uh, maps uh, by going here as geotiffs and can do further analysis in GIS with additional layers such as population density, uh, infrastructure and so although these uh, data are relatively low resolution uh, as you can see uh, you can see this green boxes this is 
100 kilometers square and you can see that the maximum rain is about 50 here 50 uh, millimeter uh, per hour so uh, it it still allows you to uh, focus on the regions where heaviest rainfall is or heaviest wind is where damage might occur you can uh, pick any particular area and do time series analysis so let's go back and that's the last feature here uh, we can look at um, say suppose 90th to 20th and 19th to 20th and uh, if you look at uh, time series area averaged and here we can pick one point that we saw had much larger rainfall and once you again plot data the workflow will launch and here is the result that I have this is at this point uh, where we saw in the map where the heaviest rainfall was and you can see it maxed around uh, 1130 and 12 p.m. on 20th um, if you are looking for any any flooding it is once you start monitoring you can expect that um, heavy flooding might occur following this. Now this concludes our GeoMoney demonstration. Um, it, uh, the ease of it is that you can click and pick options and look at this, download and then do further analysis. Uh, iMerge however is available in Google Earth Engine which has many more options and other data sets that you can work with as you will see in the next demonstration by Eric Capotest and Sean McCartney. So just for continuation I want to take a minute to uh, show Google Earth Engine and show how to access iMerge data in there. Okay. So this is a quick demonstration of using iMerge through the Google Earth Engine and if you search in the data catalog with iMerge you will get the information. The data set name is here and the uh, availability it's the same from 2000 June to current uh, almost and this is late, pro late product and this is final product every half hour data. You can get a lot of information about the data uh, themselves uh, through this link. What we want to do is quickly share a couple of scripts with you which can map precipitation, make time series and make animation similar to what we did in Giovanni. The advantage here is that you can um, have many more data sets to include along in the analysis. So let us look at a few scripts here, sample scripts. Uh, we can do map of iMerge, then animate and time series. Let's start with uh, map here. Uh, we took looking at Hurricane Maria, three days, uh, 20th to 22nd. This is the uh, image collection. Uh, here we are taking accumulated rain over these three days and then plotting uh, all the precipitation that's above five millimeter accumulated over these three days. And this is just putting map on uh, layer on the map and here is the center um, of the map. This is right over Puerto Rico. So if you run this, you will get accumulated rain. You can also find average, so mean here, minimum and maximum. You can do statistical analysis with ease here. Uh, you can make the layer transparent to see uh, where exactly precipitation distribution, where max and mean were for these three days. Um, and we can see that in this region around San Juan and South, uh, maximum rain occurred. So this is how you quickly map uh, iMerge. Let's look at time series next. Here I have picked a point right near uh, San Juan. You can make a polygon with either shape or a rectangle. And here is the point that we picked. Uh, this is the block that does time series every half hour iMerge data and here is the scale uh, that is um, in meters so this is uh, grid resolution for the data set that you are using and then if you run this you will get the time series um, and we saw in Giovanni also how um, just around 12 p.m. There was a spike. So this is a quick way of looking uh, at the time series. Finally, the animation. 
This script is just for your reference. We're taking uh, 19th to 21st. Uh, this block actually works through putting background map. So you can see uh, country outlines and you have to blend your precipitation images with the background. And that's what this block does. Uh, you can go through the script in detail later on, but this is the command that you would use get video thumb URL uh, to make the animation and you can run uh, and then you will get the animation. Here is the geometry. You can specify which region you want to look at and I already have done this. So let's look at the animation. Here's Puerto Rico. And here's Hurricane Maria between 19th and 21st. Uh, every half hourly you can see it moving. So this was just a quick demonstration of how to use iMerge in Google Earth Engine. And before I hand it over to Dr. Uh, Erica Podes, here is a site, uh, weather analysis and prediction that you would be using if interested in near real time or forecast of uh, storms. And this is from Geos5 model that we talked about. If you click here, you can get to weather maps by clicking here. And as you can see, uh, precipitation and sea level pressure and wind speeds are available here and different regions you can focus on, uh, including there is global. But here, let's look at Atlantic and the, this uh, covers Caribbean region. Um, here is initial time. So this is uh, near real time data and the initialization time. And based on that, there is forecast for a number of hours, as you can see. You can pick forecast hours up to five days. Every hourly data are available and also can animate uh, by picking a range of dates here. So initial time to forecast time, you can animate. We can just go to 16th of August here, look at um, animate. And it takes a few minutes, but it, it animates what's going on here in, in near real time and forecast time. So you can see uh, colors are precipitation and then contours are sea level pressure. If you want to look at wind speed, click here and you will get wind arrows. Here are the levels to pick from. Uh, 850 is close to the surface and you can animate that as well if you like. So when there is a hurricane going on and you want to look at in current time and forecast time, this is the site to use. Uh, there is also a way to download this data. Here is the link to downloading the data from so, uh, forecast is available here. There is data download tool. Uh, you can visit this in, in detail, uh, but this is just for uh, your quick information. And I will request Dr. Potes to uh, talk about flooding now. Thank you. Thank you, Amita, for that great presentation and demo. This is Erica Podest, and next I will cover some of the basics of radar remote sensing, which will help you better follow the demo that I will do afterwards. They're generally active and passive sensors. A passive sensor measures the emitted or reflected radiation from a medium, and an active sensor provides its own illumination source. A radar or a LIDAR are examples of active sensors. In the demo, after this refresher, I'll be focusing on an active sensor from Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR. Two of the greatest advantages of radar over optical is that since radar is an active system, it can observe the surface of the Earth during either day or night conditions, and also that radar observations can be done under almost any type of weather condition making radar particularly useful in areas that are constantly cloud covered, such as the tropics, or in areas where a disaster has occurred, such as, for example, um, a hurricane and there is um, a, a large amount of cloud cover. The radar signal can penetrate through the vegetation canopy or soil, while optical only sees the very top of the canopy or the soil, if exposed. In addition, with radar remote sensing, there are minimal to no atmospheric effects or corrections needed, as opposed to optical, where atmospheric corrections are critical for proper image interpretation. 
Finally, radar is very sensitive to the moisture content of the surface and to structure, whereas optical is sensitive to the spectral reflect reflectance signature of the surface. There are also disadvantages and that's that radar data is different than optical and it's sometimes difficult to interpret. Also, radar images have what's called speckle, which is a salt and pepper effect that makes it difficult to interpret the image and also it can result in low classification accuracy. Uh, but there are ways to deal with that. And then finally, the presence of topography can introduce distortions, but it needs to be accounted for. Um, as a final comment, historic SAR images tend to have low temporal repeat on the order of 40 plus days, making the availability of dense time series images scarce. But uh, that is changing with Sentinel-1A and B from the European Space Agency, which together they have a six-day temporal repeat. And the demo that I will be doing after this uh, will be it, it will be using uh, Sentinel-1 um, data, SAR data. So very briefly, the radar system sends a signal towards the surface of the Earth, which is scattered in different directions. The system measures the part of the signal that's reflected back towards the antenna. And so it measures the amplitude or the strength of that reflected signal or echo, and the phase or the position of a point in time on a waveform cycle. We'll, in, in the uh, demo, we will be working with just the amplitude of the signal, which is called the backscatter. In radar remote sensing, different frequencies can be used, and this table shows the wavelength and frequency range for each band designation. Usually in radar remote sensing, we talk in terms of wavelength rather than frequency because the length of the wave defines the level of penetration of the signal within the medium in the land surface, whether it's within the vegetation canopy, the soil, or snow. So wavelength is the length of the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave and is inversely proportional to frequency. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. And note that in the range of frequencies in this table, the wavelengths vary from 0.8 centimeters at Ka band to about 100 centimeters at P band. There are two important things to remember about wavelength. The first is that the longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration through the medium. And second is that the length of the wave will determine the interaction with surface objects. The wave will interact with objects that are approximately its size. So the figure here shows the extent of penetration through different mediums with different bands. In vegetated areas, X band is generally governed by the top of the canopy. C band penetrates further and L band tends to penetrate uh, even deeper into the vegetation. Likewise, in the case of a dry, bare soil, X-band only sees the, the top surface of the soil while L-band penetrates into the soil. The wetter the soil, however, the less the penetration. There is a preferred wavelength depending on the type of study that you're conducting. In uh, the case of the demo, we will be using Sentinel-1 data, which is C-band. So that's on the order of about five centimeters uh, wavelength. So here we have an example of penetration depth through vegetation with two different wavelengths in Kalimantan, Indonesia. The top is a C-band image on the order of five centimeter wavelength. The bottom image is a P-band image on the order of a hundred centimeter wavelength. And you can see that when you compare both of them that there's more detail in the P-band image. Remember, the longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration of the signal through the vegetation canopy. So we, the, the bottom image has more information about those densely forested areas. And again, here's another example on the radar signal penetration into, into vegetation. And this is uh, an image, a radar image at C-band, L-band, and P-band from an airborne sensor called AirSAR. Um, it's a NASA airborne sensor. And this is over Manu National Park in Peru, 
but this is a wetland, an inundated wetland. And these images were obtained at the same time. And you can see inundation appears as very bright in radar images. And I pointed that out with the red arrows. And you can see the inundated areas. So these are areas where there's standing water underneath the vegetation. You can see those inundated areas in the L band, and even you can see even more inundation extent in the P band image. You can hardly see any inundation in the C band image. So next, I'll talk about the radar signal interaction with the surface. And this is important for you to understand the information contents in the radar images, those different gray level tones in a radar image. First of all, radar is sensitive to surface structure, and the scale of the objects on the surface relative to the wavelength determine how rough or smooth they appear to the radar signal, and therefore how bright or dark they will appear on the image. So here we have their examples of the different scattering mechanisms. Um, the first one is specular scattering, and that occurs when there's a smooth surface, such as a, a water surface, and the, the signal scatters away from the satellite, resulting in a dark pixel in the image. The next mechanism is rough scattering, which results when there's a certain level or there's some level of roughness on the surface, causing the signal to scatter in different directions, but mostly away from the satellite. And as the surface gets rougher, the larger the signal scattered back to the satellite. The next signal interaction is volume scattering, and that occurs when the signal is scattered in multiple directions within a volume or medium. In the case of vegetation, the signal can scatter from multiple components within the vegetation, such as branches, stems, leaves, trunks, or soil. I'll talk more about that in the next couple of slides. The final backscatter mechanism is called double bounce, and, then, and that results when two smooth surfaces create a right angle that reflects the incoming radar signal off of both surfaces such that most of the energy is returned to the sensor. And these areas then tend to appear very bright in the image. So double bounce is commonly found or seen in urban areas and in areas where the vegetation is flooded inundated. And the next couple of examples will just show you um, some of these scattering mechanisms ha and how they actually look on a radar image. So the first uh, mechanism we sp talked about was specular reflection. And so here we have a mosaic of the Amazon basin. And this is from this map radar. So this is L-band and this is back from April 2015. Uh, this is uh, polarization HH. And you, you see the main, so the Amazon River uh, is very dark. And that, that's open water, and that's why it looks very dark. Okay, so that's just a very smooth surface where the energy of the satellite, that signal, is being reflected away from the radar system, appearing dark on the image. And the next mechanism is surface reflection, rough surface reflection. So these are areas that are dark, but they're not as dark as open water. And so these are probably areas that have been deforested or they're tilled agricultural fields. Um, so there is some level of roughness in these areas. And then there's volume scattering, and that these are areas where there's vegetation and the signal interacts with multiple components within the vegetation. So vegetated areas tend to have an even higher backscatter. They're, they're even, the, the pixel uh, level brightness is, is even higher. And, and you can see here the yellow circled area is an area where there's forest. And you can see that it, it's even brighter than uh, just a simple rough surface. OK, and then the final scattering mechanism is double bounce. And this occurs when you have two smooth surfaces creating a right angle that deflects the incoming radar signal off both surfaces. 
and most of the energy then is returned to the sensor. So this, if you see double bounce in urban areas and in inundated vegetation. So in this example, that yellow circle, that's inundated vegetation. And you can see how clearly all of this inundated vegetation along the river, it just pops up. So this is all vegetation where there's standing water on above the soil surface. Um, and so that's why radar really is ideal for looking at wetland ecosystems and, and inundation dynamics of these systems. So I want to uh, briefly touch on an important characteristic of the radar signal, and that is the polarization. And so um, radar systems are characterized by the band, that's very important and the polarization. The polarization means the plane of propagation of the signal. And with radar, you can have different combinations of polarization. So if you hear something like HH, that means the signal is horizontally transmitted and horizontally rece received. And so you can have HH, HV, in that case, it's horizontally transmitted, vertically received. VH, it's the other way around, or VV, vertically transmitted, vertically received. In the case of the Sentinel-1 images that we will be using, those are VV and VH. So here's an example on how to visualize time series SAR data. Since SAR is sensitive to structure, you can see differences in like different levels of regrowth of vegetation, for example, or um, degraded vegetation from vegetation that has not been degraded. And so a good way to visualize these differences is to create just a simple RGB. And this is an example of a PALSAR image. PALSAR is um, a, a, a SAR sensor uh, from the Japanese Space Agency. And this particular sensor, the first PALSAR, on board the ALO satellite flew from 2006 to 2011, and this data is uh, available through the Alaska Satellite Facility. So this is an area in Rondonia, Brazil, where some deforestation has occurred. Um, and so this is from 2007, 2008, and 2010. And what I did is I created an RGB so I can see when these changes occurred. Now remember, when you create an RGB, you have to keep track of what you put in the different channels, right? In the red channel, in the green channel, and the blue channel. So anything appearing red in your RGB image means that whatever you put in the red channel is higher, has higher backscatter than what is in the blue or green channel, all right? So that probably means that that area was forested because when you have vegetation or you have a forest, it's higher backscatter. And when that forest is cut down, there's lower backscatter. So that's how you interpret the colors. Same thing, if something is blue, that means whatever you put in the blue channel was um, had higher backscatter than whatever is in the red or the green channel. And any sort of combination of colors, say you have something like pink, pink is a combination of whatever is in the red channel and in the blue channel. So that means that um, there was no change um, between what's in the red channel, the image in the red channel, and the image in the blue channel. They were both around equally the same um, backscatter. They were high backscatter, higher backscatter than what was in the green channel. So go through this exercise. This is a great really way to get a sense of the information content in different um, images from different years. And then this gives you a sense of the different SAR satellites that have been in space, that are currently in space, and that will be in space. So uh, there are some legacy data sets. Uh, the ones that have a green box around them, uh, you can access these data through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Um, they, they are freely available. And uh, currently, the Sentinel-1 data from the European Space Agency is available through the Alaska Satellite Facility, through the European um, Copernicus Hub, and it's also on the um, Google Earth Engine. 
And then in terms of future satellites, there is the uh, NISAR, which is a joint NASA-Indian Space Agency SAR satellite. They'll have L-band and S-band. Uh, there's also Biomass, which is a European Space Agency P-band SAR sensor. So next I'll be presenting a demo on assessing flood extent with SAR and storm impacts using Google Earth Engine. The code was developed by Sean McCartney and myself, and I will be presenting Sean's part. However, Sean is here live with us, and he will be um, uh, available during the Q&A session to answer any sort of questions you might have that are specific to his code. And our demo is focused on floods and storm impacts in Puerto Rico as a result of Hurricane Maria that occurred in September of 2017. The SAR data that we will use for the demo to assess flood extent is Sentinel-1 SAR data from the European Space Agency. Sentinel-1 is a, has a C-band uh, sensor and there are actually two satellites. There's Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. They both have the same sensor, the same SAR sensor. So each satellite has global coverage every 12 days. And so uh, between both of them, it, there's about six day coverage. However, they're not both acquiring data over the entire globe all the time. Um, so it's possible that you won't have coverage every six days more likely every 12 days outside of, especially outside of Europe. So Sentinel-1 has different modes of acquisition and the one that we will be using for our demo is interferometric wide swath mode. So these are the routine collections over land. And on Google Earth Engine, if you type in Sentinel-1 in the search box, you'll get a, um, a description of the Sentinel-1 data that's there. So this data has been processed and it's analysis ready. So the data is already in, in, in backscatter in DB. So those are decibels and it's been uh, radiometrically and geometrically corrected. All right, so let's go directly to Google Earth Engine. Um, you do need to have an account and it is free. The nice thing about Google Earth Engine is you've got all of a, a number of different data sets there that you can just call and you do all your processing in the cloud. So uh, this is the code. The code it is in the um, PowerPoint presentation so you can access this code directly. And what I'll do is I'll step down through the code and explain the different uh, steps um, of, uh, of coding uh, for this analysis. So basically we have a couple of things going on here. We're, we're gonna look at flooding, we're gonna look at storm impacts and also the impact of the flood itself on um, uh, population exposed, cropland exposed. All right, so let's start with um, we're going to use Sentinel-1 data, so that is radar data. And as I mentioned in the slides, the advantage of radar data is that you are not affected by uh, clouds or um, rain events, most rain events, actually, I should say that. Um, so Sentinel-1 data is data from um, the European Space Agency. And uh, there are two satellites, and so uh, you've got these satellites that are in descending and ascending um, paths. So let's, uh, let's, let's start up here. We're defining the uh, pre-event and post or during and post hurricane events. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna look at an image uh, before the event and then one during and, and post event to look at the extent of flooding. So we're defining these dates as uh, the pre-events. So it's, uh, we're defining a range because um, one day we'll, might not guarantee image uh, an image. And, um, and so the, this is the range, the, the pre-event, the post-event, 
And then what we want to do is we want to load a shape file to define our area of interest. In this case, we are focusing on Puerto Rico. So the impact of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. However, you don't have to use this. You can also define a, your area of interest through um, a geometry. And the way you do that is you select this icon, draw a shape, or you can uh, draw a rectangle. And so in this case, um, and this is just uh, as an example, we're not using this, but I did draw a geometry for the whole Caribbean area or, or most of the Caribbean. So if, if you wanna focus on a larger area rather than a specific area, okay? So you can do that too. Um, just make sure that you comment this out up here and you name your geometry, you name it ROI, okay? Your re region of interest. Again, we will not be using that. We will be using the shape file called Puerto Rico, um, of Puerto Rico, sorry, um, as our study area. So the next thing we wanna do is we wanna load the Sentinel-1 radar images. And these images are uh, 10 meter resolution. We wanna load, uh, so they're either ascending or descending. One might have better coverage than the other. You have to um, search and just see which one has better coverage. The one thing you do want to do, however, is to use the same pass for your analysis. So make sure you define um, ascending for both the pre-event and, and um, during and post-event conditions okay or search window so uh, we did ascending i actually did check uh, descending images and there was slightly better coverage for ascending so we're sticking to ascending for this demo um, and the the dates are the, the range that was defined at the beginning pre-event and over here it's the exact same code but post-event all right and vv and vh polarizations Okay, so we keep going down and uh, what's happening is if we run the code and I like to uh, run the code as um, you, I keep adding to it. So this code is actually kind of, I would call it a demo code because there are a lot of intermediate files that have kept, but I want you to look at them. Um, so as, as you develop the code, it's, it's important to look at all of these um, different um, runs, okay? So basically, I've printed out um, the collection for pre-events and post-events. So when you run the code, you'll see a printout here on the console of um, the pre-event collection. So it tells you that there are 143 images that cover the, uh, the uh, pre-event. And then the post-event, there are 70 images that cover our region of interest um, during that, that range of time that we defined, all right? So what we wanna do is we wanna create a um, mosaic of those images for our region of interest. So we create a, um, let's see, we create a, a mosaic right here for the pre-event, so we call that Sentinel-1-1, one, one, and then the post-event, Sentinel-1-2. And we clip it exactly to our region of interest. Now, our region of interest is Puerto Rico. And actually, um, I've displayed it here. In the layers. So you can actually see the shape file that defines our region of interest. So it's Puerto Rico and its islands. All right, so as with um, any SAR images, SAR data is usually very noisy. So uh, we wanna apply a speckle filter and basically it's a smoothing, it's an averaging filter. And this defines the size of that filter. You can make it bigger or smaller and you can play around with this and compare the original imagery to the filter imagery. 
And so what we're doing here is we're adding the original um, mosaic that we created pre and, and post. I call it post, but it's not actually post. It's during and post. And then uh, we have the same, but the filtered images. All right. So I did display them here. And let's just take a look. So let's. Uh, zoom in to our area of interest. And it does look a little, um, let's, let's take a look. Some things here, I deselect, let's deselect our. So it looks pink. And the reason it looks pink is because that mosaic has two bands, VV, and VH. So let's just display one and let's just take a look at VH. So I've defined that range, the pre and post, based on the uh, coverage, complete coverage of our area of interest, Puerto Rico. Okay, so that's Sentinel 1. Pre and then let's look at post. It's always good every step of your analysis to always visualize the data um, rather than writing one big code and then uh, taking a look at um, taking a look at the end results. It's always good to just keep visualizing every step of um, code that you're adding. Okay, so this is Sentinel two. So that's the original mosaic. And so it's clipped to our shape file to zoom in. So you can see the differences between, just visually, you can now compare. Let's click on both the before and after and just overlay one over the other, okay? So that's the before and this is the um, during and, and post events, okay? So there is a distinct difference. And then if you wanna look at the, um, the filtered images, let's just load. So let's just take a look at the pre-event filtered and we'll compare the pre-event filtered with the pre-event um, original. So there you go. The issue about the filter is you do get rid of that speckly, that, that what's the, that, that salt and pepper effect in the original SAR imagery. However, uh, you do lose resolution and you can clearly see that when you overlay the filtered image, right? It, it is blurred, it is blurred out. Um, so that's the original and that's the filtered. All right, so as you're loading your images, you know, applying these filters, make sure you always look at the images. So the next thing in this code is to create RGB images. And what we've done here is um, taken the pre and post filtered images, VV and VH, and created this RGB composite. Okay, so what we've done is we've put in the red channel, the pre-event, um, so the pre-mosaic um, of our um, study area. In the green channel, what, what I'm calling the post-event, and then in the blue channel, the pre-event. 
for VV and VH. So let's take a look at that. So taking the let's take a look at just the VH. So what are we seeing? Anything, remember, you'll see the dominant color is anything that's in that channel. So if you see, you're seeing green, it means that whatever is in the green channel is brighter than what is in the red or in the blue channel, all right? Anything that is, um, in this case, pink means that it is brighter in whatever, pink is a combination of red and blue, so whatever is in the red and the blue is brighter than what's in the green. Okay, so what this is indicating, whatever is pink, that means that those areas you have um, puddled water, so you have open water. You have water there um, post event that wasn't there pre-event. So you can see this, um, that, that this looks like a, a lake or maybe it's a reservoir. You see the edges increase. So th this area has expanded. Um, you can see um, an increase in open water here on in the surface. This looks like an agricultural area. And if you look at around the island, if you look at a lot of these areas that are pink, that means they're standing uh, water, open water in, in the areas where it's pink. The areas that are green, that um, in general, green, if it's green areas means that post event or during and, and post event that it's brighter. So in general, all of the island just got soaked. So the reflectivity is higher. Um, that's why in general, everything is a little, uh, uh, has this green tone. But you have these deep green areas over here in these flat agricultural regions. And that probably means that um, the soils are soaked. So you have higher reflectivity, either that or there's a, um, a, some level of uh, double bounce. So these fields might have been inundated. Okay, so that just gives you a general idea and it's, it's good to just pan around and, and take a look at the different um, colors around the island. So the hurricane primarily, it, it came through here, it affected the entire island. But you can clearly see some, um, the areas that were inundated, standing water, and then the deep green areas, probably areas where there were fields that were inundated. So standing vegetation. All right. So RGBs are always a great way to just um, take a look at the, um, the, the differences in, um, in, in what was happening pre and post event. All right. So, so these are the RGBs. We added the layer. We just took a look. And what we're doing next here is um, taking the difference between the images. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a difference images, image between uh, pre and post, and then apply a threshold to identify these areas that were um, pink and, 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 and very green, dark, uh, deep green. All right, so we, we took the difference, and since the values of the Sentinel-1 images are in dB. These are logarithmic values. In order to take the difference between the images to subtract them, you need to divide, okay? And uh, what we did was then was add that uh, difference image to our layers here. Again, we're looking at every step, uh, what we're generating every step here. Okay. 
So this is the, the difference image. Kind of what you saw in the RGB, however, you'll see the bright, the really bright areas are the areas where there's open water. So there's inundation, um, just standing water um, without any vegetation over it. And then the, the super dark areas are probably areas where there is inundated vegetation, particularly crops. Okay. So the next thing we did is we applied a threshold um, based on the difference image values. And we applied a threshold to identify these really bright areas and these really dark areas. How did we define this threshold? This is purely based on trial and error. One thing you might want to do is you go to your inspector and you want to look at the values of specific pixels. So you go in and you look at the values of, you click over a really bright area and um, it'll give you the value here. So the difference VH, it says it's 1.6 in this area here that we clicked on. Usually you just, you really want to zoom in. And then if we click on one of these dark areas, it'll give us, uh, let's see the value in this case is 0 0.615, the dark area. So, so you do, you, you click around to get a general sense of what the values are for these brighter areas and the, the darker areas. And then these thresholds were defined based on that. This is again, purely trial and error, and you can try different thresholds uh, until you get um, the results that um, are more most accurate, okay? Um, okay, so we have different inundation products that we're developing, and let me just explain. So the first one is based on these, the, just the pure threshold, all right? So we're saying, okay, um, let's create a mask based on everything that's greater than the upper threshold or everything that's lower than that lower threshold. And um, that's our first flooded product. So let's just click on that, take a look. It's a lot of flooding and there are a lot of mislabeled pixels here. Pixels that are labeled flooded that are not flooded primarily. Okay, especially in the areas where you have complex terrain. So um, these areas will tend to um, uh, introduce an error, areas with, with terrain. So let's just go down and, and you can zoom in and you can see the terrain here. And not only that, but you can also see that there's a lot of noise in, in this first uh, flooded product that we've generated. So the next kind of, we, we need to clean this up. The next part here is really cleaning that up. And so we're saying, all right, remove um, everything that's five pixels or less, all right? so. That's what this code is doing. And we're updating our mask to remove anything, um, all, all of these kind of single pixels that are, that are noisy. If you were to have applied this on the original image, it would be even noisier. Um, here we applied it on the filtered image. All right, and then, so what happens is we're displaying it and we're saying, all right, well, display this clean flooded map now as green. So you can compare, and that's the original one, the red. Now, once we apply that uh, next filter, that's what the green flooded areas look, uh, flooded product, uh, it looks like. It's the next level of cleaning. So if you take a look here, there are a lot of misclassifications. The green, we're picking up flooding in areas where there's uh, terrain. Okay. So let's just focus on the flooded areas and you see lots of flooding up in these areas where 
there is topography. So the next filter that we want to apply is to remove pixels that are classified as flooded that are in slopes greater than 5%. And for that, we use a digital elevation model. In this case, we're using SRTM. You can use your own um, DEM if you'd like. And what we're doing is we are then calculating the slope. Um, and then we're saying, okay, let's um, identify slopes that are greater than 5% and basically eliminating those from our um, inundation product. Okay, so this is the updated product, the flooded areas that we're now saying, okay, they're pink. So that cleans it up quite a bit. If you compare the, the previously filtered flooded product and the, 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 the what we're gonna call the final flooded product, uh, it eliminates a lot of misclassified areas. Okay. So let's just stick to the pink. And so, so let's zoom out. Now, these are intermediate. The, the pink and the red, I would call intermediate products. And you can really just remove those um, from your final code. However, I kept them here for this demo um, just to show you these intermediate products that are being generated. Um, this is just a demo. This is not a validated product, so you can play around certainly with um, how you define those thresholds, the, the data range um, that you want to use for your analysis, um, the filter that you want to apply, et cetera. All right, so let's keep going down here on the code. Now, what we want to do is we want to calculate the inundation extent. So basically, each pixel um, is grid. At this point, it's it's, it's on a, a 10 meter grid. Yeah, so then we take the number of pixels that are identified as flooded and the pixel, the spatial resolution of each pixel, and then convert that to hectares. And in this case, um, it's being printed here on the console. Um, 7,376 hectares. So, and we've also printed it down here. In, in, in this um, in, in the results window down here. All right, so let's continue. The next part is to uh, look at actual optical imagery. So what we're going to do is look at the impact of this hurricane on vegetation on the island. And for that, we use Sentinel-2 images. The first thing we did was uh, created a function to mask clouds from Sentinel-2. And that's what this is doing up here. So we're uh, basically masking for clouds and, and also the very fine clouds, cirrus clouds. And uh, we'll be applying that mask um, to our Sentinel-2 image collection. All right, so uh, we are uh, doing a, a search here. Uh, actually, this sets the, the, the visualization parameters when we look at the Sentinel-2 imagery here in layers. And here we're doing the search for the Sentinel-2. This is top of the atmosphere imagery. Ideally, you use surface reflectance, but the top of the atmosphere imagery um, goes back to 2015 on um, Google Earth Engine, so it's a longer database. And, um, and so we filtered uh, before uh, the event, the pre-event, and post-event. Okay, so this is post-Maria, and um, we printed the, the results on how many images we found during this period. And then we took the median, so we created a median um, image uh, based on all of the images that were found during that time period for post um, for post events. So let's take a look here. 
post-event, 469 images. And the same was done for the pre-event where we found 479 images. So the pre-event actually went a little further back because it was really difficult to find a, a, um, images at, at, to, to cover the entire island uh, cloud-free. And in fact, even though this period is so large, pre-event, there's still some areas that are cloud covered. All right, so we did the search pre-event, pre-Maria, and we applied the, um, the, the, the mask for clouds, and we printed pre-Maria, which is here, 479 elements. And again, we created a single image based on the median. So let's just take a look at that. Um, here, as we keep going down, uh, le sorry, let's take a look at the images. So pre-Maria and post-Maria, I'm just gonna deselect the flooded areas. So that's an, an RGB of post-Maria and and pre-Maria. I just let it load. It's a little bit slow. So that's post-Maria. And that's Primaria. And, and you can use a slider to overlay them and, and look at the differences. However, what we really wanted to look, as mentioned, is the, um, the impact on vegetation, right? So for that, we did um, an NDVI um, difference between um, post, pre and post. So first we created the NDVI images based on that medium um, mosaic. Um, and we used the uh, near infrared and sentinel 2 the near infrared and the red bands okay so um, we did um, let's see post and we then we clipped it to our area of interest and we did the same thing here post uh, uh, sorry so uh, we we added the image to our layers here and then we repeated the exact same thing, calculated NDVI based on that median pre-image, and we clipped it and we added, added it to the layers. So in the layers, we've got a pre-Maria NDVI and a post-Maria NDVI. Now this gets interesting. So let's just take a look at that. So that's post-Maria, and this is pre-Maria. And let's just overlay those. So you can see the differences. Uh, okay, so let's just do it this way. So that's pre-Maria. And post-Maria. All right, let's do that again. That's pre-Maria. And post Maria, my overlays are not working really well here today. Um, it's just kind of slow on my computer, but that's pre and then post. But we can see that regardless, despite 
this being a little slow in, in overlaying things, um, we can then um, see that this through the NDVI difference. So we created a NDVI difference map here where we subtracted the pre-NDVI to the post-NDVI um, clip area and added that to the data layer here. So let's just take a look at the NDVI difference. And the areas that are red are areas where you had the most um, impact, the, the largest difference in NDVI between pre and post. And then you have the green areas are areas where there was hardly any difference. However, that's also um, the effect of cloud. So up in this area, um, if you load the original Sentinel image, you can see that there's some clouds. This is a very um, um, high elevation area, complex topography, lots of clouds. And even though we had a two year search window um, pre event, there were still clouds. And so that's coming through, that's kind of adding an error here in this area. So, all right, so that gives you an idea of the impact of the, um, the hurricane, the impact that it had on vegetation, um, on vegetation greenness. All right, so now um, let's keep going down. Let's take a look at the, uh, how many people, the exposure of this event to people and to crops. Okay, so one thing we wanted to do was we have a flood map. Now, where are the, where's the population? And so for that, we called a, um, a data set on population density on Google Earth Engine. And so we loaded it here and we clipped it to our region of interest. All right, and then we created a raster showing the exposed population using our flood map. So the remember the, the 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 final flood map is called inundation three, and so we updated it to sh um, to just indicate areas where there was flooding and there was uh, population to identify population exposed. All right, so let's uh, keep going. Okay, so what we did here was then take the population density and take the inundation map and really count the, um, or, or just isolate the areas where you had population, large population densities and, and inundation. And then we identified or we estimated the exposed, directly exposed population. And, um, and, and we printed the results down here. So we also brought in a roads layer. Um, so you can pull a data set on infrastructure from Google Earth Engine. And you can see the road infrastructure for the island. And um, you can then overlay the flooded areas to identify which roads have been or are directly impacted by the flooding. Okay, so this is just a visual, but it's a really kind of a good way to get a, an assessment or to have an assessment of the infrastructure that's been affected by this flooding event. Okay, so let's keep going down. There are other data layers here that we also pulled. Um, one is a land cover. And so this is just a, a, a land cover classification from 2019. Uh, we clipped it to our area of interest and we then took the, so that's the land cover. There are many different classes, but um, if you wanna look at just cropland, we, um, we we're identifying here just uh, masking out the class identified as crops. And then we identified, based on the, the 
class identified as crop and the inundation product that was generated, how much cropland was inundated. Okay, so that's what we're doing right here. And we then calculated the um, pixel area of inundated cropland. And that's what we're doing in this area and in, in this part of the code. And we converted that from meters then to hectares. All right, and we're printing those results to the console, but we are also printing that to the, um, the results window down here. So basically, so here you can also then just look at the affected cropland. So this is the area where there's crops and where there was inundation. And so to really display things um, in a nice way, in addition to just displaying things on the console, uh, there's a whole section down here that's part of the code to display the results window that contains then these estimates of the actual flood extent of the um, uh, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the estimated area of affected cropland, and the estimated number of people exposed. So all of that is here. And you can always um, yeah, use this and, and, and change this code according to what you want to print out. And, and that's it. And then in the final part of the code, there's a commented out um, just code on how to export the image. So if you want to export that inundation, that final inundation product, um, you can export it as a raster. So in this case, a GeoTIFF. And um, what happens is you the, the tasks window, actually, since it's commented out, it's, it's not appearing, but you go to your task window and then you will um, you, you will initiate that download. So let's just run this to show you very quickly how it looks like when you're exporting an image onto your Google Drive. So if you go to your task, that's the file that you want to save, and you actually have to uh, say activate it. You, know, you, you have to uh, say run in order to save it. It doesn't automatically just save, save it on the, on the uh, drive. So you click run, and um, here you define the, the pixel the spatial uh, resolution of the product that you want to save. So the actual original pixel resolution is 10 meters um, of the original image. We did apply a filter, so the actual resolution is not 10 meters. However, it's gridded to 10 meters still. So let's just um, let's just say 10 meters, and uh, and you hit run, and it might take a little while. So I'm not going to do it, but it might take um, a couple of minutes, depending on the um, if you want it to run faster, you actually change that um, scale to a higher number to make the file smaller. So that's it. That concludes this section of the demo. And I, I, as mentioned, you can run this demo. The, the link to this code is on the PowerPoint file. So you're welcome to run it, to play around with it, and to adapt it to your area of interest. So there will be one homework assignment. The answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed uh, through the RSET webpage. The homework will be uh, made available on August 26. So that's the last day of this webinar series. And the due date for the homework is September 15th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars, complete the homework assignment by the deadline, and you can expect then the certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marines Martins. 
So here's our contact information. You can reach out to any of us if you have any questions about the material presented today. Also, if you're interested in accessing the presentations as PDF or the recordings, you can go through the RSET training uh, website and we will be posting those there. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them in the order that they were received. So we gather all of your questions onto a Google Doc and we will post that document on the training, on the RSET training website following the conclusion of our webinar. Thank you very much. Online we have John Englander, Amita Mehta and Sean McCartney and we're ready to start the Q&A session and answer your questions. Great, so we have been gathering your questions in a Google Doc that we will be sharing with you here on screen. And um, let's go through the questions. Any question that we don't get to during this session, we will write up on this, we will answer on the Google Doc and we will be posting the Google Doc on the RSET training page. Okay, so let's start with the first question. The satellite data overestimates sea level rise. And I, that would go to John Englander. John, are you? Hear me? Yes, there you go. Sorry. Um, I don't believe the satellite data does overestimate sea level rise, or sorry, underestimate. No, overestimate sea level rise. Um, I think it's a very accurate uh, depiction of global sea level down to the millimeter level. Great, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. The next question is for the GEE script presented by Amita in the link provided in the lecture notes, I can only see one of the codes. Is it possible sh to share the other two codes, animation and time series? Yes, I, I think they should be available, but if the scripts are not available, we'll provide the link. Um, I think all three should be visible. Great. So the next question, how does the new ICE SAR compare to Sentinel SAR? Okay, that's a great question. Honestly, I'm not so familiar with um, the, the ICE uh, SAR data. I do know it is X-band data and the Sentinel-1 SAR is C-band data. And as mentioned in the refresher, um, the wavelength is very important depending on the type of study you're doing. So X-band has a smaller wavelength than C-band. And the difference there will be that C-band will have greater penetration through a, a, a vegetation stand, okay? So you'll probably see more structural or um, a different characteristics of different crops, for example, with C-band as opposed to with X-band because X-band tends to be a shorter wavelength. All right, the next question. Question to Mr. Englander. The Indonesian capital of Jakarta is in danger of sinking in the next 10 years, and this has become a hot topic of discussion in Indonesia. There are those who argue that it is not only sea level rise that makes Jakarta sink, but excessive groundwater extraction is making it sink quickly. What do you think about this? I would word it differently. Sea level rise is not actually making Jakarta sink. The relative sea level rise seen in Jakarta is a combination of global sea level rise plus local land subsidence, which is extreme. Jakarta has one of the highest levels of subsidence in the world, several meters in the last few decades. As you note correctly, the biggest factor in subsidence is groundwater extraction. Great, thank you very much. All right, the next question, 
what is the advantage of projecting geospatial and remote sensing visualizations and images in GEE as compared to visualizations in R or R Shiny? Okay, so I, I can answer that. I actually, I don't, honestly, I don't have experience um, projecting these or, or creating these visualizations in R or R Shiny. I guess the one advantage of doing these things in GEE is that the data is, there's a large database already in GEE that you can easily call. And there are other data sets in GEE that you could potentially overlay. So it's since everything is on the cloud, it is um, easier to integrate different data sets. Um, I don't know, Sean or Amita, would you have anything to add? Okay, so let's move on to the next question. N number six, as for flooding in a city, there is a practical question. How much are we going to lose due to anthropic influence? What is the natural risk we can't influence? What are the immigration, the real relocations that are compulsory? Wow, so this is a very loaded question. Lots of things here. How is it going to affect logistics, urbanization, food, energy, water industries? All of this can be factored in sea level rise uh, mitigation adaptation cost benefit analysis. John, I'll let you answer that one. Thanks. So this can be misleading. While global means sea level, is being forced by the increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, there is a long lag time for the giant ice sheets and glaciers to melt. Even if we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero immediately, the ice on land will continue to melt for centuries due to the excess heat already stored in the sea from the past century plus of global warming. So it can be misleading to correlate cost-benefit analysis in other words, the cost of increasing sea level rise for the next century and longer is due to the burning of fossil fuels until the present. The sooner we stop adding to greenhouse gases, the sooner that the melting will slow and that sea level rise will slow. But considerable sea level rise is already committed or locked in, probably well more than a meter and possibly two to three meters, if not more. Great. Thank you very much. Question seven, when comparing SAR pre-data and post-event, do they need to have the same viewing geometry? Yes, absolutely, they should. And so that's why it's important that if you're do, you, you need to use ascending pass for both pre and post or descending for, for both, but do not combine ascending and descending. Next question, considering that some small islands are very small, Aren't they particularly complex for remote sensing, considering the, space, the poor spatial resolution? Um, yes, I'll, I can take that. Um, it, it is challenging to use remote sensing for um, small island nations. but And so many remote sensing data, they're not high resolution like we saw iMERGE or MERA. They're tens to hundreds of kilometers. So, not ideal, but they provide large scale coverage. They can help guide a broad scale area which where you are trying to observe features and it, it can guide where you can take high resolution in situ measurements based on remote sensing data. Also, there is continuous regular temporal coverage that also helps in observing changes over time. Even though not in great detail, it can provide you broad scale view. So that's one advantage. Also, as Erica showed, Sentinel-1 and 2 uh, resolutions are now 5 to 20 meters, and that's reasonably good to resolve several features. So combination of data sets uh, can help um, in, in observing features or phenomena on small islands using remote sensing. That, that is the whole point of the exercises that we showed that um, it can be useful. Great, thank you. Okay, so question nine. I find the NDVI difference approach quite dangerous. Even an exact 365 day time difference might not really mean that one will have fixed NDVI in a specified region or that non-flooded factors might also change them. 
What are the suggestions for operational use of NDVI for flood extent estimation? Um, Sean, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, thanks, Erica. Yeah, that is a really good point. So we showed the NDVI difference, uh, and it was more of a demo post Hurricane Bria, and the focus was less on flooding and more with damage to vegetation resulting from Hurricane Bria. I mean, there there could certainly be other factors impacting vegetation health that were outside of the scope of of the hurricane, uh, and these could be uh, due to drought. Uh, before or after, it could be landslides, et cetera. Um, but in terms of regarding an operational use of NDVI difference for flood extent estimation, that's something we'll have to look into. Uh, preferred methodology is something that was shown earlier in the code for flood extent, and that's the use of SAR data, synthetic optical radar, or other optical data, um, not, <clears throat> not just microwave energy, but also optical outside of vegetation indices uh, specific to flood extent estimation. Thank you, Sean. Okay, question number 10. If you change the polarization from VV to VH, there may be changes in the areas that are displayed as flooded. For a complete map of flooded areas, should one combine the results of both polarizations? That's a great point. So this was just a demo um, to show you just some, some very basic things on how to map flooding. But um, as I discussed in the refresher, really for flooding, there are two signals that you're looking for in the radar. You're looking for open water, and that's very dark on the radar. And you're looking for flooded vegetation, and that appears as very bright on the radar. Open water can be better detected with VH polarization. Inundated vegetation can be better detected with VV polarization because VV tends to penetrate further through the canopy. So yes, absolutely, um, that would be more a little more complex, but absolutely uh, for a better um, map of, especially of um, areas that are flooded, flooded vegetation, it um, would be better to combine VH and VV. So maybe in a future webinar weekend, that would be kind of the, the next step uh, for this tutorial to do something a little more advanced, even use machine learning. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next question. And I apologize that we are over uh, past the hour here, uh, but uh, let's try to get to as many questions as we can in the next couple of minutes. Uh, question number 11, can the Sentinel data be applied to calculate the surface temperature? Um, Sentinel-1 cannot. So radar is sensitive to structure and to moisture. However, Sentinel-2 can be used for calculating surface temperature. It does have a thermal band. Question 12, what are the applications of INSAR during flood events? How does an INSAR work to monitor the water level changes during the flood events? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, INSAR is a little more advanced. It's called interferometric synthetic aperture radar where you're looking at the change in phase and you're associating that to, um, to, to change in water level. And so that's certainly uh, a, uh, a webinar to consider in, uh, future, in the future, future trainings. Question 13, are there any good resources that break down the uses of different bands? I'm very interested in multi-band, multi-temporal research. Uh, Sean or Amita, do you wanna take that one? So I can't say that, um, so there have been a, a couple of trainings on SAR and we've provided the link. Uh, we've done some trainings also on using uh, optical data to map flooding. Um, and, and you can use, say if you're using some sort of random forest uh, decision tree based approach, you can introduce different bands as different layers to inform the classifier. So you have, say, VVVH, and then you have Sentinel-2 bands, uh, say, eight bands that you're using to identify um, uh, uh, not only flooding, but different types of land cover. Yeah, and Erica, I'll just, I'll just add to that as well. Um, we can certainly add some links to there if, if this person's interested in multi-band, multi-temporal research um, with the use of different bands. There's some great literature out there, and we'll, we'll certainly include that before we post it on our website. Great, thank you. 
question 14, given the global coverage of six to 12 days of Sentinel, when would be the earliest after disaster then one, one can conduct an assessment such as the one demonstrated in this webinar? Um, so you would have to search and uh, what you would wanna do is, I mean, it's kind of luck, right? You might have an image that's uh, taken during the disaster or during the event. You might have an image that um, is uh, two days after the event, three days after the event. You, you take what you have, basically. And what you want to do is you want to do a search um, uh, of ascending and as well as descending um, images. And uh, you might have better luck that way. But keep in mind that if you have an image that's four days, five days after the event, you might not be uh, have a, an assessment of the full flooding extent. So that's kind of what you have to deal with in, in terms of temporal resolution. Question 15, in St. Lucia, where we've had rapid terrain change in small areas, you mentioned that the 10 meter resolution is gridded, but not the actual resolution. I know SAR resolution is not straightforward, but what is the smallest resolution you can safely quote as it makes a difference in much smaller islands? That's, that's a great point. So yes, SAR, um, SAR is characterized by having speckle. So it's that, that salt and pepper effect that um, usually you apply a speckle filter to remove that effect. Um, and that re reduces the resolution. Obviously, the bigger that filter, the more you reduce that speckle effect, but the more you, you reduce your spatial resolution. Another thing you can do is you can do um, a, a time series averaging. So if you have many images, basically you average all of them, and that maintains the full resolution of your pixel. So that's another way. That's a way to keep the actual 10 meter resolution and have a clean, quote unquote, SAR or cleaner SAR image. The only thing about doing that is if you're looking at a disaster, for example, at a flood, then if you do a time series averaging, you're averaging out the signal that you're really interested in, right? So it's that flooded vegetation, um, which occurs only over a couple of days, for example. But if you're looking at other features, say land cover over long, long term, then time averaging is fine. Okay, question 16, why does inundation show as light in radar images? Okay, so the short answer there is because it's, uh, it's dominated by double bounds. So if, if uh, I suggest you go back and do the, the ref, uh, review the slides here, or also the introduction to SAR webinar, um, that explains that more fully. But the way the signal interacts with the land surface when there's inundated vegetation, it's a double bounce scattering mechanism. Okay. Question 17, sometimes water is not detected with Sentinel-1 imagery near urban areas. Any suggestions? Hmm. So I'm not sure exactly what that means in terms of water not being detected near urban areas. I'm not sure what conditions this um, the, the person that posted this question was referring to. I can tell you that, um, and I'm, so water, so remember there's open water and then there's inundated vegetation. So water above the soil underneath the vegetation. Um, water is not detected. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what are the implications here in which areas water is not detected. So usually, if it's open water, it's easily detectable with radar images. Do cross polar question eighteen? Do cross polarized data provide more information on an inundation area? Uh, yes, uh, on an open water and an area that's inundated where there's open water. So open water means there's no standing vegetation. Okay, so wow, it seems like uh, we've gotten through the questions. Um, all right, well, thank you everyone for hanging in there and uh, for all your questions. And uh, thank you very much to all of the um, speakers, especially our guest speaker, John Englander. I don't know, John, would you like to say a few words before closing? No, it's been fascinating. I've, I've learned a lot 
And uh, this is at a technical level that I don't normally deal with, but certainly the data uh, from uh, accurate remote sensing of sea level is critical to, uh, to seeing what's happening. I hope that people understand we can't project to the future based upon the current. And uh, those that want to find out more, not to promote my, my book, but moving to higher ground will probably fill in a lot of the things that I touched upon today. So thanks for the opportunity. Great, great to have you here. Uh, Sean or Amita, uh, uh, would you like to say any closing words? Thank you, Erica. I think it was really very informative. And um, again, I just want to reiterate what we, one of the questions talked about, small islands being challenging for remote sensing. And that is true to a certain extent, but then there are still advantages in using uh, remote sensing along with modeling data and multiple sensors. Um, it, it has been useful in many islands. So that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Sure. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and uh, I, I def definitely wanted to extend our appreciation again to John Englander for taking part in this presentation. Yeah. I also want to thank everybody from the team uh, and for everybody that's that's joining the training today. Uh, we'd love to hear if you're able to use the code, uh, if you're in your own study area to assess inundation, we'd love to hear from you. So please do keep in touch. And, and um, yeah, we hope you find value from some of the code that we shared. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So yes, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Also, the GEE code that uh, we demoed is in the presentations. So uh, stay tuned. On uh, next Tuesday, we will have our second session, and that's going to be on sea level rise. We're going to have guest speaker uh, Dr. Benjamin Hamlington from JPL talk about um, sea level rise at a regional to local scale. So uh, wishing you all a great day, and um, we uh, will see each other or hear each other uh, next Tuesday. Bye-bye.